Um, so we're going to do similarly, I'm going to have questions for the entire panel and maybe one or two of you, if you don't mind, will just offer to answer. And then there are questions for specific individuals. And then hopefully you will answer those because we did have a couple yesterday where the panel just went quiet. So we'll see if they all get answered. <laughs> all right. All right, we'll get started. The first question is for Wayne. So um, why can't you use your good relationship with the Department of Agriculture to get samples from taxidermists? We can do that and we intend to do that. Um, it's a matter of, of setting it up and uh, getting an organization uh, and uh, in agreements with them so that we can get the samples that we want. And we're concerned about the risk of of um, mix-ups that the taxidermists, our biologists are concerned that uh, if we don't take our time and make sure we get a good relationship with those taxidermists and set up a protocol that we might end up uh, getting positive animals that were mismatched with the tags. And so we might be chasing positive animals in parts of the state where we really didn't have any positive animals. So that's part of it. Okay. Great, thank you. The next one's for Kip. There he is. How do you avoid confusing the public when you say feeding and baiting is bad, but camera surveys are okay, and keep big bucks and kill more does? I think the first part of that, the baiting and feeding, um, the, the baiting is often a bigger issue with that um, in places where, or in, in more states, I should say. So, uh, um, I don't think the baiting and feeding are, are great uh, environmental things to be doing from a stewardship standpoint. Um, I think year-round supplemental feeding and certainly the amount of bait that's put on the landscape during many hunting seasons, uh, Michigan being a perfect example, uh, very, very different from uh, the short period of time that a very limited amount of, of corn is put on the ground for most of camera surveys. Um, anybody that hunts in Michigan, I'm sure, has seen the, the pictures in the past of, you know, the entire truckloads of carrots and potatoes and everything else that's being dumped on the landscape that then uh, is either there for weeks or, or months over the course of the year. Um, and I guess I should have clarified that during the, the camera survey. You know, it's very small amounts of, of corn that's used for a very short period of time. So uh, um, just from a relative scale perspective, a, a much different, uh, much, much different uh, respect. Um, the other half of that, the, the deer or the, the buck side, um, I, I acknowledge that, that, that older bucks are certainly more likely to have the disease. And, uh, and I highlighted some of that in my talk. Um, we've seen lots of presentations over the last two days showing that. Uh, I think the best data coming out of Wisconsin that shows that. Um, I think the argument really goes back to, uh, you know, on paper, is that the best way? And, and the answer is probably no. But, uh, but as we know, we don't, we don't manage deer on paper. We manage deer in the real world. And, uh, and in many of those places where you take a look at the, you know, the number of, of three or four or certainly fully mature bucks around the landscape, um, even though they may be two to four times more likely to have it than, than antlerless deer, you know, in a lot of those cases that there are far more antlerless deer that are four or five years old than there are those, those uh, that same age class of bucks. So I think it is responsible of us to take a look at not just talking about it but from the buck side, but trying to understand it from the entire deer herd side. If we could tell hunters, you know, drive age structures very young on both sides, um, yeah, then we, we certainly could do that and probably should do that. And the reality of it is it just doesn't happen. Hunters are just unwilling to do that. And uh, I'm not sure that there's an example anywhere where across the landscape they have done that successfully. So I think that it's if we can use them to increase antlerless harvest so that we don't allow the age structures of does to also grow very old and, and those deer herds to, to grow grossly above what those habitats can support or what we want from a disease end. If it takes a few older bucks out there to, to keep hunters harvest and antlerless deer, then, uh, then we're better ahead in the long run uh, going that route. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wood, has Wyoming considered mandatory testing of deer and elk to increase sample sizes? And in addition, and are you taking a stance on feed grounds? Uh, well, that's a fun question. Um, as far as mandatory submission, we have talked about it. Um, we certainly don't have mandatory submission now. We actually don't have mandatory checks, although if we do have a check station, we require that hunter stop. And we've talked about mandatory submission and particularly in areas where we would like to get more data. Um, so that is something we're discussing, but certainly isn't a decision that's been made. And as far as feet grounds, boy, that's that's its own can of worms. Um, and I think that Dr. Samuels yesterday probably put it best that, you know, artificially concentrating wildlife is probably not a good idea. 
But of course, CWD is not the only thing that we're dealing with in that feet ground system. And I guess anybody who works in management probably recognizes that there are a lot of drivers at play in making some of these decisions. And feet grounds are a very difficult one. Um, and I guess that's probably all I could really say. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. This is for state agency reps. This is two parts. We'll start with the first is, have any of your states provided general fund money for CWD management? Um, Chad mentioned that about Michigan. Or has any has the cost been entirely uh, borne by licensed dollars for state agencies? For Pennsylvania, the answer is uh, we've received absolutely no uh, state money. Uh, so the, the hunters have paid for everything. Next. The same is true in Wisconsin. It's primarily a licensed funded activity. However, we have augmented our CWD funding with Pittman Robertson, but that's also um, tax on ammunition and equipment. Yeah, so for Missouri, we have the, uh, we don't get any general revenue dollars, but we do have the dedicated one eighth of 1% 1 sales tax, which makes up about 60% of our budget. So um, obviously license and permit sales, but then that other source of funding has been able to pay for most of our CWD efforts. Uh, yeah, that's the same for Illinois. Uh, uh, our CWD management and surveillance is all paid through uh, special appropriation from our uh, game and fish fund and supplemented with uh, Pittman Roberts. Dr. Wood, I think you're left. Yep. So in Wyoming, actually, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. So uh, we have had funding through our general commission dollars and license funds. But um, for a time, we did receive general fund uh, to fund actually my program, our veterinary services program, uh, a lot of that due to brucellosis. And we were able to piggyback and do a little bit of CWD work in addition to that. But that funding has been cut and we are back to all um, game and fish dollars at this point. Okay, and then if each of you could say, what are the deer population estimates for your state? Pennsylvania, on the order of 1.4, 1.5 million, and that's um, maybe with a <laughs> little guesswork in there. Uh, we do have a, a few problems in Pennsylvania. Uh, our reporting rate of deer reported um, it's required that people report your deer. However, our reporting rate runs between 25 and 30 percent. So uh, our deer estimates are, are done by our deer teams that go to butchers uh, each year and collect uh, age samples. And we also uh, then check the tags to see what proportion um, are not reported. Next. Um, I couldn't give a, a population estimate for Illinois. Um, our deer harvest runs approximately 160,000, 150,000 a year, uh, animals a year. Um, in our CWD areas, uh, deer densities tend to vary. Um, in our core area, uh, when we started, the uh, estimate was approximately 20 deer uh, per square mile. Um, and that varies uh, up and down, uh, you know, some areas much, much lower numbers and others much higher, so. Yeah, so Missouri, we're shooting 250 to 270,000 a year and that, that put us in a ballpark of one to 1.2 million deer. Tammy? We've generally been around the 1 million mark as well. I don't know what exactly what we're going into this season, but I'm guessing it's around one, 1.2. Is that, I'm going to look at Bob. It's approximate, I would say even higher than 1.2. Okay. In Pennsylvania last year, we estimated uh, about 345,000 harvested. Mary? So in Wyoming, I honestly could not give you a number for our total population. Um, like I had mentioned, we harvest between 70 and 80,000 cervids. So that includes deer, elk, and moose. Um, and reality is, is we don't have a lot of data on white-tailed deer in our state um, that's not very heavily monitored. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't know the total number. Thank you. And then Chad? Um, I, 
would say that in the UP we could use a few more, and the low pe lower peninsula we could use uh, fewer fewer deer. Does that count? <laughs> yeah. All right. That's like the end of that answer. Dr. Collins, what is the compliance rate for um, herd certification programs of and I'm sorry, what is the compliance rate for herd certification programs of the annual record keeping related, I think related to? Well, it's 100% because there's no way a herd could be certified if they didn't submit it. So that's easy. So the records are complete and submitted to the state. That's the rest of the question. Yes. Dr. Nichols, can you provide more information on herd certification and an approximate 50% positive test testing on positive captive fines? I'm going to hand this to you just so you can. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question. Herd certification, 50% positive testing on positive captive fines. I'm sorry, I just simply don't understand the question. Is the person that submitted it here, can can you clarify this for me? And it's on certification, 50% certification, which we, we, I don't know what that means exactly. Okay. Um, we'll keep I would love to answer it, but I, I'm just not sure what it's asking. If you're not comfortable with that, we can always do it afterwards. Come see Dr. Yeah, Nichols. Yeah, please find answer. me if you're too shy to raise your hand and help me out here. All right, we'll try the next one. For the 12 captive privately owned servid facilities with five plus years of monitoring and the nine that were enrolled in the USDA certification program that have become CWD positive since 2012, have they been depopulated with an associated level of CWD prevalence determined? That's for us, you guys. So I think that's going to be. Would you repeat it, Kelly, or we can Hello, talk yeah. about it? So, you probably know this better than anybody, Sean. Yeah, no, no. So the question is, um, this is of the certified herds though. Of the herds that are certified that have been positive since 2012, have they been depopulated and an associated level determined of CWD prevalence determined? How many haven't been depopulated? Two down in Texas? Yeah, there's one in Minnesota yet. And then uh, well, a couple in Pennsylvania. Okay, so if they're certified, that's different. Like the Texas herds are not certified. Right. So is this asking for I, certified? I think it is talking about the certified herds. Um, not all of them have been depopulated. The ones that have been are, are out of business. None of them have repopulated or got back into business. And yes, and the ones that are quarant the ones that haven't depopulated are quarantined. Other than those, yeah, the hot ranches aren't certified herds. So. Right. There's two of those. And the prevalence was determined anytime there's a depopulation, every animal is tested. So I don't know that we have the prevalence rates at our fingertips here, but um, certainly that is known information. I can I can sort of attest to that because in the last three years or so, even before I joined veterinary services, I was I've been involved in collecting samples from depopulated individuals. It seemed like a terrible waste not to get any uh, data off of those individuals. So it depends kind of on a number of factors, um, how quickly a herd plan can be put in place um, if there's litigation involved. So the longer those animals stay in that facility, we have seen an increase in prevalence. So I've seen everything from zero, where there was one individual that was found, for example, like a, a situation of misadventure, they call it, so got stuck in a water or some such thing, and that individual's positive. When we depopulated the rest of the herd, none of those individuals, rest of those individuals were positive. And then I've seen situations where they had stayed on the landscape due to issues, nothing to do with our control, where the prevalence rate was, was quite high, over 70%. So you kind of see a mixture in there. A lot of times they're on, on the lower side, 15, 20. Um, that's just what's ever been in the last few years where I've been involved. It asked about the, uh, the nine that were in the, in the certification program. The ones that weren't in the certification program were hunting ranches, so they can't be certified because they, you know, part of the, they can't meet the full requirements of the certification program, such as mandatory uh, inventory, mandatory tagging, you know, if an animal's born out in the in a hunt ranch, you know, they can't be tagged. So they're not allowed to move 
live animals. All animals must have come out of those facilities, you know, feed up. So that's why they're they're still testing. You know, it depends which state they are at what level. Some states test more than others, but uh, they just they're not certified. But they actually were still in the programs. And then the second part of that question asks at what level prevalence usually tips the scale. We've had several herds, uh, including the one here in Michigan years ago, that only had one animal, the one red deer herd in Pennsylvania. I mean, or in uh, Michigan, in Minnesota, and you know, so one animal normally tips the scale. I mean, it is just a matter of testing that one on on the certified herds. Thank you, um, Brian. How can we get the federal government to fund more research on CWD? <laughs> As a federal employee, I am strictly prohibited from lobbying Congress. <laughs> Chad, he has a lot of questions, so we'll see how we do here. So, and um, have your have there been any thoughts on providing collection boxes? Current check station times and locations do not work for many of the working public. Yeah, and and we I think we've talked about it a little bit. Ultimately, what we do is we provide a seventy two hour grace period. You know, after the animals harvested um, to get your to get your deer in, you don't have to be the same person to check it in if you can find someone to bring it in for you. We've loosened some regulations up even this year where you'd only, you can bring in just the head instead of the entire carcass. And obviously that's, that's a, a, a compromise to sort of, you know, for individuals who are harvesting deer when it's a little bit warmer or, or after a, a check station is closed uh, where they can actually get the meat cooled down and, and processed. So we've tried to make some, some exceptions on this to, to allow for it. And, and with the 72 hour window and, uh, with, uh, with some of the new changes we've made, we, we still feel like there's an opportunity to, to get a deer into us. Obviously, this is, somewhat, we're, we're gonna, this is a constant evolution. Um, it's something that we certainly can look at, but as, as our CWD zones continue to expand and we start to get even more and more stretched thin on staff time, this is something that we're realistically gonna have to pursue. We felt like we could sort of cover it with what we have existing, but you know, with new locations in Montcalm and, and now Macosta, and existing areas in, in the Lansing area, um, we're going to be stretched pretty thin pretty soon, I think. So those check boxes are, are probably a good idea, and I think one of the, the valuable things that would come out of this that we need to seriously consider moving forward. Thank you. Thank so you, for let me, I, let me go back. I feel like I did an injustice there to researchers in general. Um, disease research funding tends to follow the, I guess what we refer to as the disease du jour. For instance, you know, when BSE broke, there wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a ton of funding out there, you know, internationally. Uh, when, uh, when disease apparently crossed over into human hosts, the amount of funding available for BSE work just skyrocketed. And then as soon as, as researchers figured out the link of, of foodborne, you know, um, you know, transmission mechanism with BSE, and we started to see that epidemic curve come down the other side, and then we started to see the human epidemic curve come down the other side, guess what happened to the funding? It dried up. So funding tends to follow what's most important in the eyes of funding of funding uh, entities out there. So with, with CWD, I mean, we got some, some significant funding up front from a lot of different sources. Uh, but then, you know, other things came along. I mean, avian influenza, you know, other, you know, significant uh, disease entities out there. So when it's a limited pool, uh, it's hard to chase that down. So yeah, I think maybe that's a, that's a better answer. It's going to be really, really challenging, you know, to see that type of funding being restored. Um, and it's and it's very consequential for the researchers and ultimately for the deer managers out there um, who, you know, I mean, that, that chart we saw yesterday afternoon where the number of peer-reviewed publications tracked the funding. And as soon as the as the, the federal funding started to greatly diminish, we saw the number of peer-reviewed publications just kind of crater. Oh, that's very real. I'd never seen that data before, but it's very, very telling. Um, so I, I don't know how you get that funding stream back, but I agree from a, from a research standpoint and from a management standpoint, it's very important to be able to, to try and identify alternative sources of funding. So, Great. Thank you. So for one of the panel members, 
Can you speak to the challenges of disease management slash surveillance in areas where positive cases border urban communities, where hunting is not allowed, and where there, where these urban communities are not interested in participating in lethal activities? Thoughts on changing the reluctance of these communities to participate in sampling? Someone willing to take that, please? I can start off and just offer that in the early years when we first detected CWD in the southeastern portion of our state, it was outside of uh, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, in a very highly residential area. And so with, with that knowledge and the fact that firearms and working closely with the community and the local unit of government, firearms were um, not the preferred method for reducing the herd. And so we did embark upon a, a live trap and removal program, basically live trap and cull. But we were um, able, so we were, that in itself allowed us to get uh, large uh, box Stevenson traps up and then uh, capture deer that way. And then we would take them off site and then um, cull them off site. So that was more socially acceptable. Thank you. Anyone else who'd like to add something? I'll, I'll add Michigan's perspective because we, we have found it in urban areas, but I don't know if we've exactly seen what is expressed on the card. You know, contrary to that, we've actually seen a lot of support from our urban community. Uh, now, we are fortunate that that community where, where we found CWD had already implemented sort of an urban archery managed hunt. So they have already become sort of accustomed to at least the idea of killing deer. So it wasn't much of a step for them to sort of buy into the idea of having sharpshooters in that area. Um, contrary to that, we've actually received a lot more resistance in some of these more rural areas um, where we want to bring sharpshooters in and there's a lot more resistance there. So we've actually seen somewhat of the opposite what the card indicates um, where there's a lot more support for deer management inside an urban community, inside some of these sort of urban forest preserves than outside of, of the urban setting where it gets a little bit more rural and, and hunting is more sort of ingrained in the, the tradition of, of the, the folks that are living out there. They don't want the sharpshooters sort of infringing on, on the deer. So um, it's become a lot more of a challenge for us to implement sort of intensive surveillance or management in some of these more rural areas than it is in the urban ones. Um, I can just speak a little bit to our, our uh, the conditions in Illinois. Um, um, we too have uh, been going down this whole urban deer management uh, trail for, for a number of years and have uh, a number of uh, active deer management programs in urban and suburban areas through deer population control permits or, or uh, uh, hunts uh, managed by these uh, forest preserve districts and, and conservation districts. So, uh, so uh, relative to uh, calling deer for disease management, it, it hasn't been an overly difficult uh, trail. Um, but I think in general, uh, even with uh, urban suburban homeowners who, who you're approaching to ask, you know, can we shoot deer in your backyard? Um, you know, I think, I think if, if you can explain the whys in a way that they can understand and, and, uh, uh, and demonstrate that you can do it professionally, uh, uh, efficiently and safely, um, that there, there really is a, a, a minimal amount of resistance. Thank you. Uh, for the panel, should carcass importation bans also prohibit lower jaw bones? Anyone? Actually, I'll address that. I, I think that's a very good question. And then there's actually a few states now that have rewritten their, their carcass importation bans to, to specifically include, I'm sorry, to allow, specifically allow lower jaw bones. Um, we actually got a, a, a box of jaws from Illinois a couple of years ago. Uh, a gentleman sent them to our national office, all cleaned up museum quality uh, lower jaw bones to use as, as teaching aids. And uh, our national office uh, talked to, to some folks at the Georgia DNR and uh, were told immediately, you know, what you have is illegal. You know, it's, it's illegal to bring that in from Illinois. So uh, they disposed of them properly. Um, is the risk there for something in, um, 
uh, you know, from a, a list of allowable items, upper canines, et cetera, I think you know, the risk from lower jaw bones is certainly not any higher than those. And I think most states who have prohibited them just haven't even considered putting those on the, the allowable list. So uh, I know that, that uh, or I believe anyway, that Minnesota and there's a couple others that have specifically allowed them just because I remember writing the, the support letters for those management items. So uh, I think it certainly should be allowed and unless the, some of the disease folks would suggest otherwise. Uh, I know there's a lot of people saving jawbones today as, as they learn to, to estimate age of deer and then tie that into the whole management program. So I think that's a very good thing. And uh, I would hope that, that more states would allow it unless somebody from a disease end would suggest that there's a high risk from lower cleaned lower jawbones. Didn't somebody yesterday say that, that bones, not necessarily jaw bones, but bones and antlers were like the least infective and they do allow ivories, correct? I guess from what, you know, from what I understand about, you know, disease, a cleaned lower jaw bone would hold very little risk. Plus, if somebody's going to the trouble of bringing a cleaned lower jaw bone back, it's probably for their collection or for, you know, educational purposes. So I just really don't equate a ton of risk with a cleaned lower jawbone. Um, but I like to add to that something like, you know, Mike, I think was talking about yesterday. You know, it's not the importation of the carcass that really matters. It's the final destination of the carcass. And if, if you, you know, there's a very low risk of transporting a deer carcass across a state line as long as, you know, the unusable parts end up below ground. Yeah, so I like to keep coming back to that message. It's, it's not the carcass, it's the disposition. If it ends up out on the landscape, there is where it constitutes risk. It doesn't, doesn't constitute risk if it's in somebody's collection in their bedroom. Okay, thank you. Um, again, for the panel. So we state that so far CWD has not been found in a person, yet we also say not to eat meat from CWD infected deer. So doesn't that really mean that we think CWD can be transmitted to people and are we just afraid to come out and say that? I tell, I tell people it's unwise to eat any sick animal. Under what scenario would anybody think that it was wise to eat a sick animal regardless of what the disease was? So the caveat, I'm not a human medical professional. I don't pretend to be, but I would suggest that, yeah, I think even on CDCs, there's a caveat there that's kind of an out of an abundance of caution. We suggest, you know, not consuming it. We, you know, the, the, the World Health Organization, you know, their guidance uh, came out after BSE, and everybody stopped. I mean, BSE is a different um, has um, is a different disease than CWD is. Uh, but but the science that has been done suggests that you know that conversion rate is it's in the same order of magnitude. You know, the cell free conversion studies uh, showed that you know CWD crossing over into a human form of disease is in the same order of magnitude. Now obviously that's in a that's in a test environment. You know, so the but the guidance that comes out I think is out of an abundance of caution. And it's geared towards um, letting people make educated choices. I would not tell someone myself, you shouldn't eat it, but I'll, I'm happy to give what the CDC says. Um, different folks have different aversions and tolerances to various risk factors. Um, so I think our best guidance is to, is to tell people what the health organizations say, give them access to all the science that's out there and let them make up their own mind. Thank you. Sean, you showed there are around 2,300 captive facilities enrolled in a certification program. How many captive facilities are there in the U.S. and then what percentage of herds are enrolled? I don't know if I said 2,300. What was uh, that? Was for mine. Okay. Enrolled person. So, so repeat the question again. Total capital facilities in the U.S. Uh, the the last um, Department of Agriculture study, USDA study, said there were seven thousand, but I don't. I feel it's closer to ten thousand. A lot of states, uh, Alabama, um, Texas, 
Missouri even, you know, it's it's gray weather, you know, it, under the Department of Agriculture, they're under um, the DNR. So some people don't get surveys from the Department of Agriculture, some do. So I don't think they got a true grasp on the full amount. I'd say there's closer to 10,000 facilities actually in there. Um, Did that Texas A&M study? Or there, I think it was 10, they're using the uh, the Texas A&M. Uh, we just did a recent one here. We were at three million, a three billion dollar economic impact, uh, three point three. Now it's like a seven point nine actually, and I think they were right at like eight thousand is what the latest one said. But same thing again. I think they're using they're they're going off of that USDA study, so um, our Department of Agriculture study. Uh, I would think as I add it up and I look state by state, that it's probably closer. When you think all servants too, that's another one too is. You know, some of the reindeer people, I don't believe, get all the studies, you know, and, you know, there's other, you know, fallow deer, psycho deer, you know, there's, you get down to Texas, you know, bear, singas, everything. So I don't know where you draw the line, but uh, I truly believe it's probably closer to 10,000. And then as um, far as percentage uh, of herds on a roll, they said it's, it's 2,300, uh, the number right you have. There. Yeah. And but with that 2,300, that's the only herds that can do interstate commerce. And in some states, that's the only herds that can do intra-state commerce, commerce as well. Or if they're not, they have to go to a terminal facility, hunt ranch, or to slaughter. Correct. Thank you. Um, Dr. Wood? Has the National Park Service played a role in surveillance or testing for CWD with Yellowstone and the Grand Tetons National Parks facing the threat of CWD that could have major impacts on those parks? Um, so that's probably a question that I can't really answer. That probably is a question for the National Park Service. Um, you know, we certainly collaborate with them. Um, I, I believe they do some surveillance and testing in the parks that are in Wyoming to the best of their ability. And certainly um, I've seen publications coming out of National Park where they've done a lot of live animal surveillance and sampling of elk. Um, so I know they certainly are well aware of CWD and they're doing some work on that, but I probably can't speak to the extent of what they're doing as far as surveillance goes. I can, um, well, I can't answer the question precisely, but you know, National Park Service does have a very active uh, wildlife health program uh, led up by Margaret Wild and with a, with a handful of other veterinarians uh, stationed around, around the country. Uh, they've had active research going on in places like Rocky Mountain National Park, where a lot of the uh, a lot of the elk work has been done, cooperative elk work. Uh, they have a project I think it was fairly recently completed um, in Shenandoah National Park that one of our researchers at the National Wildlife Health Center was involved in, looking at surveillance design and and risk out there. So I think in general the answer is National Park Service has been very very involved in the science um, on their lands uh, because they do. Uh, CWD exists, at least, you know, in, in a couple of National Park Service properties and is uh, probably a, a, a imminent threat um, or a very close threat uh, to some other properties. But with regard to their specific regimen on, the, on Yellowstone, I, I really don't. But that information is certainly available. Thank you. Um, related, but not directly. So uh, I know that the Fish and Wildlife uh, Service uh, refuge system is looking much more closely at CWD and CWD management, particularly on their properties in and around uh, CWD infection. Yeah, along that line, um, you know, we've got a we've got a meeting scheduled with the Upper Mississippi Fish and Wildlife Refuge, where they've invited uh, partners from uh, states of Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois um, to try and figure out, realizing that um, you know their property is right there um, at, on the on the edge of uh, the Wisconsin CWD areas between Wisconsin and and Iowa, Illinois. It all comes back, all comes together. And they're a, they're a significant landowner right in the middle of that. So uh, they want to get involved with the with the science. They want to get involved with the active management. And and again, um, just like Park Service, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has a has a very active, um, you know, growing uh, wildlife health program uh, led by Dr. Sam Gibbs. So you know, it's a good outfit. If I could add to that from the sportsman side of it, uh, the. Park Service is looking more at doing these calls now too, instead of doing the translocations and moving animals. Uh, Wind Cave uh, and Custer down there just did a call this past year in South Dakota. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt in North Dakota did a call where we actually got, and I actually drew one of the lucky numbers, got to go in there and shoot six elk. 
So, you know, that's something as sportsmen we should be encouraging our congressional delegation and people to uh, push the Park Service towards because all those animals were were, ta were tested, you know, but instead of just letting these elk populations grow, you know, why are we not in there, you know, with the hunting population, taking them out and taking advantage of that. Thank you. Chad, why is the Michigan DNR inconsistent about management for CWD by prohibiting importation of carcasses from anywhere, but assuming CW exists where we have not yet detected it, but eliminated the sunset for mandatory APRs in Northwest 12? Are you assuming the disease just not does not exist there? So I told you antler point restrictions were controversial, right? Um, so I, I don't know if it's reasonable to say that CW exists where we haven't found it, but I also don't think it's reasonable to say that it doesn't exist there. Um, ultimately, we haven't found it. And ultimately, we have a regulation in place with antler point restrictions that a lot of people like. Um, so at that point, I think it's worth pursuing and keeping that there and not having sort of the specter of CWD affect the entire state when we're only finding it so far in one area. Um, that being said, uh, we've got some really challenging decisions to make if we ever do find CWD up in an area that has mandatory antler point restrictions. We've got a lot of discussions to take uh, and, and, and some maybe other people to get advice from. We've already seen how Missouri and Pennsylvania have approached that topic. It's, it's very different, but it's all ultimately data driven. And that's, I think, ultimately what we have to rely on. I'll, I'll add a little bit to that one because we find ourselves in that same scenario. We've been asked why, why not just completely repeal the antler point restriction. And the response is that we're, we're, we're testing, we continue to test in those places where we still have, we've not identified the disease. And so it's in many ways a very good regulation. It's popular and so we shouldn't, we shouldn't go backwards in some ways on deer management, doing quality deer management in those areas. Uh, in an effort to protect from something that may not currently be there. So that's been our approach, although as it continues to spread, we have fewer and fewer counties with the antler point restriction. I just want to mention too, uh, you know, I've looked at the numbers and I need to be convinced with the, the statistics because I will be convinced if I, if I find that it's essential for us to do away with antler restrictions in order to solve the problem. But if you look at West Virginia, now I believe West Virginia and Wisconsin each have a three-inch a three inch spike regulation and have had all along, and they've both gone exponential. So obviously that wasn't a magic bullet. Thank you. Tammy, with Wisconsin's seemingly passive approach, and CWD seems to be increasing across the state. Does Wisconsin plan to keep that type of approach or change to a more aggressive CWD management plan? So our, our primary response right now is monitoring, um, monitoring the disease where it, where it exists, um, trying to detect it as well so that we can continue to provide information to our hunting public and the citizens of the state on distribution and prevalence of the disease. Uh, whether or not our response will be more aggressive in the future is going to be completely dependent upon what the public sentiments are in the new areas of detection. And so um, as exemplified in the northwestern portion of the state where we now have five years of working with a citizen advisory committee, um, we have implemented things such as um, CWD surveillance permits which gives landowners the opportunity to harvest additional deer so that we can get them sampled. But um, we haven't gone so far as to actually identify population reduction methodologies. That's just not um, where the public in Wisconsin is currently at. Thank you. Dr. Nichols, what work is being done by the USDA to ensure not only the public trust is protected as well as captive servants? Well, I would say the encouragement of um, captive producers to participate in the program for the main reason that it requires 100% mortality testing. So those animals are tested. If, and if a facility is not a participant, they might not be. So I mentioned earlier about the longer it's in place, the greater 
um, prevalence you see. So what happens with our mortality testing is we tend to pick it up rather early on premises that are part of our HCP, which is kind of the point. Uh, we don't want them to sit there and, and build up high levels of infection. So when we find it early, then we have an opportunity to do something about that. Great, thank you. There's another part to that question. Okay. Please describe what oversight measures that are taken to review each state's captive CWD program, um, particularly non-compliance of CWD testing that may be below the USDA standards. Okay. And unfortunately, I am not the best person in our three-member team to answer that question. Um, I am the, the science arm of the apparatus and not specifically the um, the indemnity and um, uh, captive compliance section, so I will do my best to answer that question. I know that every year the states have to submit annual reports about their captive um, facilities and that sort of information. And there, there is a question, it's like, okay, are, are they being compliant? And so it's, it's the responsibility of states to make sure that those facilities are in fact following the regulations to be in the HCP. In our new program standards that are going to be coming out, our revisions, um, we have attempted to address that issue to assist states with making decisions and then um, helping hopefully with courses of action for sites that are not um, behaving in a compliance oriented manner. Thank you. Kip? QDMA policy is to support voluntary APR. You praise the DNR for extending mandatory APRs in the Northwest 12 counties. Wouldn't voluntary APR be better for deer management in those counties given the high level of support if CWD does surface? I think that voluntary regulations are the way to go anywhere possible, or certainly when they are provide a, a high level of success. Um, I think there's some situations that, that warrant a different tact, um, and it largely comes down to, to hunter density numbers, where you have much higher hunter densities. Um, voluntary regulations like that uh, have just not proven to work uh, anywhere. Pennsylvania is a, a perfect example of that. Pennsylvania has some of the highest hunter densities of any place in the country. Um, a one buck bag limit and forever, even with a one buck bag limit, Pennsylvania over harvested the buck segment of that population and it was widely known as being the poorest managed state uh, in the US from a deer management standpoint. Um, the, the antler point restrictions were, were in place in, in Pennsylvania and, and the deer management program has had been a tremendous success since. And, uh, and I think that's the same reason uh, that they work so well in the, in the Northwest 12 in Michigan. You know, if Michigan had two or three or, or five hunters per square mile, I think voluntary restrictions would work phenomenal, just like they do in Oklahoma and Iowa and, and a lot of other places. Michigan has somewhere around 14 hunters per square mile, and uh, just from the sheer hunter number, um, just makes the voluntary aspect of that um, almost unsuccessful in, in every case. So um, I think Penn, or Michigan, Michigan and Pennsylvania actually are very similar in many respects regarding deer hunting. They both had deer density or deer herds for a long time and high densities and high hunter numbers and just a rich, rich hunting uh, tradition and culture. And um, the fact that antler restrictions uh, uh, implemented by the, the DNR and the, and the Game Commission are far more successful for protecting yearling bucks in those situations is tied directly to the high hunter densities. Thank you. Can I add on to that, Kelly? Um, so, and I certainly don't want to make this an, an APR discussion because we're here for we're here for chronic wasting disease, but uh, State of Michigan has a process that uh, we have in place now for well over 10 years to implement antler point restrictions. And it's, it's essentially a social, uh, it's a set, essentially a social tool. And the process that we have in place is if we do a survey and we get 66% support, ultimately we move that forward. And we feel like a two thirds majority that's in favor of a regulation ultimately is worth at least bringing to our commissioners for a, a, a recommendation. Now the antler point restriction that was proposed earlier this year up in uh, tuber uh, but where we have bovine tuberculosis was simply an attempt at uh, looking at some of the data that we previously had with increased antler, antlerless harvest from uh, these Northwest 12 counties, um, especially that first year, um, and then looking to see if we can sort of stimulate um, some additional analyst harvest in that area, uh, knowing the full risk of increasing age structure in that area. Where we have CWD, we've, we don't have any antler point restrictions on any license. And in fact, we actually allow the take 
of analyst year as well on those licenses during those seasons where elsewhere we prohibit the take of analyst year. We, we, we require an analyst license. So um, obviously it's a topic that needs to be discussed in terms of disease management, but um, it's, it's, uh, it's still for the most part at a statewide regulation, a, a social issue. Um, and that's pretty much how we've adopted it. You know, I'll, I'll add one thing to that. I've been with QDMA for over 15 years now, and in the early years, uh, antler restrictions were, were always a hot topic wherever you went. And, and literally over the last five or six years, the only time an antler restrictions even come up in conversation anymore are in Michigan and in New York, uh, two states that have very high densities of deer. And in almost every other place, there's just such a cultural shift and, and hunters just willfully pass a million bucks that they're just not needed. And that it's almost a non-issue. Um, the number of hunters that are here makes it an issue. But I think in this particular situation, it's, it's a unique opportunity for the state, given how much support there have been shown for antler restrictions. And I think over the whole CWD issue, there has never been a, a bigger need to have a close working relationship between hunters and the agency. So I think the agency should jump onto anything that they have with regard to to hunter support for something to just continue to enhance that working relationship and just drive that ship for as far as you can go. Thank you. Dr. Collins, how many deer were tested for CWD from captive facilities versus how many should have been turned in based on inventories or yearly summaries? If you don't have the exact number, thinking maybe you don't have that off the top of your head, what would be a ballpark percentage or figure of compliance? All right, so I definitely know that in 2016, we tested um, 1,200 roughly um, deer from Farm Survey. That represents about 5% of the total herd in the state. As far as compliance numbers, um, it's a little bit harder to pull an actual number on it, but what I can tell you is that um, in 2015 and 2016, the Department of Agriculture has been looking at that very closely. We generate numbers um, for each herd in the state um, based on the inventories that they report to the DNR. And we tell them exactly the number that they we would have expected them to test in that year and the number that they actually tested and then um, tell them what the difference was. So again, I can't tell you the actual percent that's in compliance, but we have certainly considered that a high priority in the program, have done a lot of work on it in the last two years, and we have seen our compliance numbers increasing. Um, I would also like to add that the two positive animals that were found this year were in direct um, response to that letter. That producer told us specifically that he got the letter, submitted heads. So clearly that's um, working. Thank you, Dr. Collins. This is for the panel. It's more of a statement, but if there's anything that you can add to this. Um, they want to make sure that you involve the tribes and keep the tribes informed of new regulations and information. Next for the panel. Well, I oh, can respond. Sure, Tammy. <laughs> I'm just gathering my thoughts. Um, <clears throat> so I would offer that in the state of Wisconsin, we have a, a very good uh, partnership and collaboration with the tribes. Um, and they are especially concerned um, in response to the more recent findings in Wisconsin on captive servid farms, which are in the CETA territory. Um, as a response to that, um, for example, they had a public meeting at um, one of their reservations earlier this fall. Our agency um, went up there and basically provided, our agency as well as the Department of Agriculture, um, went up there and provided them with all sorts of information. They are also um, very interested in doing CWD surveillance, so we're also supporting them in that regard sharing with them our protocols and um, procedures that we have um, at our fingertips with our 15 years of experience of doing CWD surveillance in Wisconsin. So um, it is definitely uh, working with the tribes is an important priority for our state. Great. 
I can add up just a, a little bit to that as well. That um, at least in USGS, we're in the Department of the Interior, and we do have a trust responsibility, you know, to to tribes, and we take that take that responsibility quite seriously. Um, over the course of the last, you know, ten years, um, you know, just National Wildlife Health Center, we've put on uh, multiple uh, wildlife disease workshops for, you know, specifically for uh, tribal biologists, technicians, game wardens, you know, things like that, um, just to 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 help share information. Uh, about wildlife disease in general, about, you know, risks associated with, um, you know, with dealing with, you know, uh, mortality events out there on the landscape. So we try to be as responsive as we possibly can um, to, to tribal needs regarding not only CWD, but, but other, um, other diseases of wildlife as well. Um, I know that, um, you know, when funding was available, um, the congressionally mandated funding that came, you know, through USDA, uh, that USDA had a very active outreach program working with tribes and much as individual states signed cooperative agreements with USDA to receive some of that funding to conduct surveillance. I don't have numbers, but I know that, you know, there are a lot of tribes around, uh, around the nation um, that did enter into those cooperative agreements and received at least some amount of funding to help um, offset the costs of, of surveillance for, for CWD. So, so there's definitely a history of a, of, a, of a pretty strong effort of involvement with tribes. If I could also just add as another example in Wisconsin, um, working closely with the Menominee tribe, a uh, por portion of the um, reservation falls within one of our 10 mile radius surveillance zones around a captive positive facility. So this season, um, they are working closely with our agency and getting samples from tribal harvest into the system for sampling as well. And they did, um, I know that they did have access to US um, federal funding for um, incentive for tribal hunters to participate in that uh, surveillance program. Thank you. Chad. Why should Michigan be more concerned about CWD than hemorrhagic disease? Um, well, we've had both, right? And we're seeing rebounds in areas where we've had hemorrhagic disease. We've lost deer there. And we've actually got a pretty good relationship with Michigan State and some researchers that are showing that deer herd are recovering there. I think the data that we've seen presented over these past two days is that we let CWD get out of hand, we will probably not see deer recovery there. So one is, I would say cyclic and one, one is permanent. And I'll, uh, I'll take my chances with the cyclic one. Okay, so this is for um, the agency folks, maybe just quickly mention, um, is, just mention it. The question is, is Michigan the only state with mandatory check? What other states have mandatory check or do you? Uh, for Missouri, we have mandatory, um, we have a telecheck system, so every animal has to be reported. Yeah, in Illinois, uh, you know, obviously we've got checking process. We do have mandatory check stations, manned check stations in uh, for the seven-day firearm deer season in CWD counties, but otherwise it's a, it's a remote check-in. Pennsylvania has mandatory checking, but people don't check. 25 to 30 percent of them are actually checked. So, um, how do you deal with that part? The part of the reason for that is because um, um, they don't have to check their deer until so many days after the end of season. So many people forget with a lengthy season, and. Um, there's a history of so many deer being taken in Pennsylvania that they just never have gotten into the tradition of um, checking deer the, the way they could. I've offered the uh, <laughs> my experience from coming to Vermont. Uh, we probably have 98, 99 percent uh, checking there because if anybody doesn't check their deer and we find out about it, you lose your license for a year. They don't care about the, the, the money, but uh, losing your license for a year, eh, they stand up and they, they check. I guess I hear two parts to the question. We we do have a mandatory registration process, which I think is analogous, analogous to check, but um, and that is an electronic um, process now. It used to be in person, but that changed in 2014. But then I also think about from this question in regards to CWD sampling and is it mandatory or not? And um, 
just as a tangent, I guess, we have had mandatory CWD sampling in, in the past in our two core areas in the southwest and southeastern portion of the state, but we no longer have mandatory CWD sampling. It's all voluntary. So in Wyoming, we do not have a blanket mandatory check, but if we do have a check station um, in place, hunters are required to stop and be checked. So it just depends on whether we are actually out there with a check station. And then as far as CWD testing, that is voluntary, uh, but we often ask people if they would allow us to take a sample. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Nichols or Dr. Collins, is it possible to link indemnification to compliance? And then also, and can costs of regulated regulatory program be borne by the industry? Okay, so um, can you repeat the first part of the question because I want to make sure I'm answering that yep. sufficiently. Is it possible to link indemnification to compliance? Okay, so that's a good question. And that's something that we've struggled with in the program because we get indemnity requests from both HCP certified herds and those that are not. And so what we've done is tried to become more transparent and have sort of a game plan, like a, a standard question and answer about what the herd, what, what qualifications the herd meets. And, you know, we prioritize the indemnity funding according to that. So for example, we are going to prioritize our HCP herds for indemnity. Those are the folks that have been trying to, to do you know, the right thing and be compliant and have their mortalities tested. So that, that's where we're gonna typically focus our funds. Um, and then we kind of work down from there. So we've tried to um, make that process a little more transparent. And then, I'm sorry, the second part. <laughs> it's okay. And can costs of regulatory program be borne by the industry? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, I, I don't honestly know the answer to that. I, I know that I suspect that would not be particularly well received. Sean might be able to address that aspect. I think it's 3.5 million is what we have now and uh, no, the industry would not be able to bear that. Uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's a lot, you know, so uh, we went to Congress to get that money and uh, you know, it, it's a lot of money to me, but you know, when I look around it, you know, and we talked earlier about indemnity uh, for some of these herds and you know the size they got, but uh, it's only usually about a percentage. It's never full value that these guys get. And you know, right here in in in, in Michigan is probably a pretty good example. Of, think about what type of indemnity and what it's done for your TB program, or you know, maybe Dr. Averill back here could talk about you know what type of TB compliance or what type of you know could you do with these dairy herds without the indemnity and the funds, the federal funding for that. So. Um, whether it's a necessary evil or not, uh, it makes it makes the program work, you know, and it gets the herds put down as fast as possible and off the landscape. And I think that's the goal is to is to remove the animals as quick as possible before the load, environmental load, gets too high. And, and I should add that our indemnity funds every year are limited, so hence the prioritization um, necessity. Thank you. I think there's one more thing that should be added about that and. Um, when there was more federal funding, um, the, the industry has already started to bear more of the cost, at least of the testing, because there was federal funding for the testing through 2012, and that was taken away. And so um, there already has been some of the cost borne by the industry for the testing. Yeah, thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, my own home state of North Dakota just this past week made it mandatory that we pay for our own test. Our state had picked up the testing when the federal funds run out. So each state's a little different, but uh, the majority of the states require the producer to pay for it themselves. So we do pay for the testing that we submit. Um, and, and then we take it to that next level as far as research. A lot of the research going on today with CWD and the genetics and the live testing is either being paid for by the industry, you know, and or by with funds that the industry has went to Congress and got. So. Uh, um, you know, we are trying our best to, to support that level of it. Thank you. Chad, do you have any statistics on the percentage of deer herd reduction in DMU 333? Since um, the DCP tags have been issued, has the deer population in DMU 333 stabilized, increased, or decreased? 
so that's that's a really challenging question because DMU 333 has changed every year because we keep finding new positives. So it's continually growing. Um, I would say that where we have been finding CWD specifically in Meridian Township, it has decreased. But that's not because of hunting. That's not because of disease control permits. It's largely because of, of the efforts of our sharpshooters. There's really no or very limited hunting that's occurring there. Um, so, no, I don't have those answers um, for statistics. I, as, as I showed in my graph, I, I don't think our disease control permit program is necessarily uh, influencing a, a reduction in our deer herd. 62% um, of the permits that are being used are being used during the hunting season. I think what it is is essentially people that would normally buy an analyst license for what's now, I think, $12 are now getting a free permit for $0 um, and taking the deer that they would normally take. So I don't think it's having a whole lot of impact as far as lowering the deer numbers. Thank you. Doug, here's a question for you. Why haven't you developed a way to test mountable bucks without destroying the cape? It seems they'd be the desired samples. Um, yeah, so the uh, we don't have, I guess, we do, test uh, mounted uh, bucks. We just can't do that uh, uh, in the same manner that we do for other animals. So what we do is uh, uh, try to coordinate with the hunter to uh, have either the deer mounted at one of our sampling vendor or uh, more often uh, have the caped skull then taken to either a sampling vendor or to a, a drop-off location where where the deer can be tested. It's just a matter of uh, you know once they once they remove the skin from the head and they and they uh, cut off the the antler cap, then uh, then what's left can be tested as long as it's done uh, as it, as the head is kept chilled. Um, you can freeze it, although that's not preferred, um, but then uh, submit it in a timely fashion. Thank you. I was going to add a little bit about the uh, population reductions, just from our experience with our calling, um, and as was as reported in a study uh, published um, earlier, uh, to to create significant population reduction, it takes multiple years of uh, of pretty uh, of intensive effort. Um, White-tailed deer populations seem to be incredibly resilient. And uh, um, it it takes uh, it takes multiple years, three or more years, to really create a significant population reduction. Great, thank you. So our time for question answer answers is really kind of winding down here. I doubt that Chad has thirty minutes of a closing. I could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I'd ask um, what seems to be one more interesting question for the panel and for most of you to respond. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get through everybody's questions. I'll make sure that the panel members do get them so that you they can see what you're interested in hearing about. So the question is to each of you, many of the reports focused on the number of animals tested. What are your suggestions for management, sampling, or communication if you got to start over? So if you, if you just found out today, after everything you've learned, what would be something that you might suggest for management, sampling, or communication? Um, well, I, I've pondered that question quite often. Um, you know, obviously, uh, 15 years ago, uh, we were, and I'm sure Tammy would agree with, with me, um, we were really grasping in the dark. Uh, there were so many questions that we didn't have answers to um, uh, that we do now. And so uh, uh, and so that's a good thing. I know from the Illinois perspective, I think I think uh, uh, from our actual implementation, I don't know that we would really change much. Uh, I think uh, given where our outbreak occurred and uh, 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 you know obviously the the impact that we've had, I think has been very positive. Where we were lacking um, at that point in time was in our conveyance of, of our information to our hunting public. Um, a lot of that was simply because the questions they were asking, we couldn't answer. 
and uh, uh, we just didn't have the information. We were using our, uh, you know, the best information that was available at the time, uh, using, uh, you know, our intuitions and, and developing a, a strategy that uh, we felt was the best way to proceed. So uh, uh, looking back, if we were to do it again, I think we it would be beneficial for us to try and get in front of uh, the information and uh, uh, develop uh, more positive relationships with those hunters. Um, I guess I would say one regret um, was when we found that first CWD positive in the captive facility. Um, we felt there was probably a pretty close link to the other captive facility and while aggressive recommendations were made, they ultimately weren't approved. And so that's one of those that that time to introduction, time to detection is kind of always there. And so, so that regret for, for our Macon County one. Uh, the other one, I guess, would be that uh, we probably didn't early on get as aggressive with sample collection, especially as it relates to surveillance and that need to do additional surveillance following the hunting season. And I think that's one thing over the last couple of years, we've tried to do a better job of kind of modeling what Illinois has said um, in terms of setting a sampling goal um, and, and trying to use that as a number to communicate with that local hunting public to try to encourage them to do everything we can to get them to submit samples because that's been a, a continuing struggle for us to get sufficient numbers of samples and make meaningful decisions to move forward and getting them to buy in with that as early as possible is one of the things we've tried to correct as we found new positives on the landscape and part of that is correcting it through through the mandatory sampling on opening weekend which gives us a much bigger base of samples that we hope we won't have to go back and do as much surveillance sampling following the season but yeah i guess that would probably be the one that the communication with the with the individuals around where positives are found to be clear in our expectation or our desire for sampling numbers of course i wasn't in pennsylvania uh when they got the first positives but in looking at the numbers and what they did in terms of um, surveillance i think they did they did a pretty good job um, my concern more is that once they had positive animals on the landscape, they, did, they didn't do anything about it for a few years. And so uh, uh, there was a very strong resistance, um, well, very big concern that the public was going to be mad at, mad at them if they went out and shot animals. And a lot of that stemmed from the controversy over the animal restriction. So I think in terms of the learning experience, and I concur exactly with these guys, is you have to communicate with the public and you have to try to design a good sampling design, but then all the logistics of putting that in place with the agency, the communication, getting the people that can extract, you know, all the processes that you have to do just takes time and it's a learning experience that those people have to go through. So I don't think you can shortcut it too much. I think any time that you start a new program that you're gonna have those learning experiences that uh, they have to deal with. For for me, I guess I'd, there's a couple of key um, things that I would identify, including choosing your words wisely in the communication, um, our communication. As I mentioned in my presentation, um, you know, we sought out at the onset to eradicate the disease, but what the public heard was that we were, that the, the UNAR was out to eradicate the deer herd, and that was not never the intent, um, certainly significant herd reduction was, but they heard eradication of disease and that made it a very difficult um, path forward and kind of getting to the trust issues, um, you know, with um, between hunters and, and the agency. So um, just being clear um, in your communications and use in the words and maybe awareness of what the impacts of the choice of words might have. <laughs> Uh, and then also providing an end game. Um, at the onset, we sought out to be aggressive in reducing the um, number of deer for disease management, but we didn't at the same time concurrently say, we're gonna do this for the next five years. And at the end of that five years, we're going to reevaluate. Um, and I think that that's something that um, perhaps having that end game because it just wasn't known at the onset, you know, well, you want to reduce deer numbers? Well, for how long? And so um, providing that that kind of threshold point in time where you're going to 
reevaluate and reconvene and engage the public in uh, the next phase of, of management and decision making. And then um, <clears throat> the last key item, I guess, is involving the public early. While we certainly did do that in Wisconsin and throughout the in entire 15-year uh, timeline, what we saw in evolution um, in was more of the uh, convening of citizen com committees, um, similar to what Michigan is doing with their stakeholder group. We've um, had several stakeholder processes now in Wisconsin, as well as localized in areas where new detections have been found, but involving that public early, um, and then uh, keeping that partnership strong throughout uh, the, the duration of your response, and um, basically, you know, waging their, their opinion and desires as to what they're comfortable with as far as tools that um, you may want to implement towards management strategies. So, um, well, obviously I was not in Wyoming in 1985. Um, I do really wish our folks knew then what we know now about CWD uh, would have been certainly a different ball game. And I think as we've kind of looked at, you know, all the situations with CWD across the country and um, tried to learn some important lessons, I think, again, that longer than you think lesson holds true for management as well. And the reality is, is it appears that management for chronic wasting disease needs to be implemented very long term, much longer, I think, than a lot of people may have expected. And this certainly plays into communication as well. And I guess looking at um, what has been done, what has been tried, a lot of times management that may very well have been effective was unfortunately prematurely ended. Um, and that probably is a lot to do with communication. And so I guess what I would think would be um, work hard on the communication end, work well with your people, try and get that support, prepare them for the long term, and commit to the long term. Anyone else want to provide I'm, last thoughts? The, the one on the end here, yeah. Um, overall, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the way our agency and our state has responded to this. Now, granted, we're on a much smaller timeline than a lot of these other states, but uh, when we found it, especially in our free range in deer, I think we identified the seriousness of it right away. Um, we had leadership that was uh, willing and committed enough to sort of take an aggressive response to it, um, which I think is unique. And, and that that approach has been sustained to this day. Um, I think we've sort of had sort of a radiating sort of out from where we found it, sort of focus on intensity for, inten for surveillance and management. Um, and I think that seems to be fairly appropriate. Um, we've, I feel like we've engaged our, our hunters and, and other partners early on. Um, if there's anything I say that could probably be improved is uh, potentially we've lapsed in some of that communication and sort of updating it. Um, so that's something certainly we're, we're working on and, and I think can be improved. But overall, um, I think the partnerships that we've developed, um, the approach that we've taken, um, I, I think for the most part, we have really no regrets on it. Um, we've also had a, a fairly extensive and diverse uh, communication approach, um, trying to get the messaging out. So um, I, I, I've, I'm really actually really proud of how our agencies responded towards, towards this discovery. Well, thank you. And um, we can just thank the speakers. It's always difficult to sit up here and take the difficult questions. So thank you so much, speakers.